So with the power of editing, I have yet to fall on this course. <laughs> I'm Eric Baker, and I've lived in Tennessee my entire life. However, for the last decade touring the world, I've only seen it passing by from a windshield. But finally, Tennessee is calling me back where I belong. There's a place you've never been. It's right where you want to be. I want to rediscover how great my home state is, and I want you to come with me. Unshot. On this episode of Tennessee Uncharted, I've climbed out of the mountains surrounding my Knoxville home and into the fertile fields of the Cumberland Plateau. Rising more than 1,000 feet above the Tennessee River Valley, this tabletop of sandstone and shale dates back more than 500 million years. Flowing through this terrain is the Obed Wild and Scenic River, one of Tennessee's last remaining free-flowing rivers, which over time has carved out a steep maze of rocky ridges and ragged ravines. In fact, it's these very features that have led me here today, and I am not alone. Climbers from all over the world can be found hanging from these walls, and they tell me that climbers sometimes repeatedly take falls of 20 feet or greater. And they also tell me that under the right conditions, falling while on rope, surprisingly, may be one of the least likely ways to get injured. But I'll be honest, none of that makes me feel any better about what stands in front of me. While the climbing here at the Obed Wild and Scenic River may be world renowned, sadly, my skills are not. In fact, this is the first time I've ever been rock climbing. But with over 350 permanent routes, I'm hoping that the Obed has something to suit my skill level. Now, a little bit about safety. Everything in this uh, safety system that you're attached to, from the harness to the the rope to the anchors to me is ready to hold three, four, five thousand pounds. I think you're under that, so um, you know you've got a really big margin. Have a major ego that weighs a ton. So, so and you're going to be on okay. top rope, which means that the rope goes to the very top of where you'll climb. And if at any time you you slip, you you decide you're tired and let go, you'll just hang on the rope. You may swing out a little bit, um, but the rope's got you. Eric, are you ready? <laughs> I'm as ready as I'm going to be. <laughs> I think you got it. You got this to the top. All right. I'll have you know, I'm not comfortable making my way to the top of a ladder, let alone the top of a hundred foot rock face. But the view was well worth all the sweat and shaky legs. Can you touch them? Touch the anchor? <laughs> no, not yet. Bring your feet up a little more. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> This is a pretty amazing thing you guys have here. It is. It's something we're excited about. It's Climb with the Ranger, and we do it every first Saturday of the month. We've been doing it, uh, it'll be two years in February, so we're going coming up on two years. Over okay. the course, we've, we've taken around 2,000 people rock climbing. And it's, it can be a tough sport to get into, you know. It can be a little intimidating for somebody that's never done it before. They don't have the gear. They don't have the knowledge. But we have all that. We have all the gear. We, we you know, we're, we're very familiar with climbing and how to do it safely. And so someone can just show up here, meet us here, and uh, we have all the stuff. We take them. It can be a really good introduction. Good. It's um, free. It's right? free. Absolutely yeah. free. Uh, currently no reservation system or anything like that. You just meet us at Lily Bridge, and we take you climbing. And uh, it's really exciting to see people that have never had the chance to experience it before um, get out here and try it for the first time. I mean, you're a good example. Now we've got lots of folks coming from New Zealand and China and France and whatever to climb here. And it's neat, to see, it's, it's neat to see them trying some of those activities as well. And yeah. A lot of them love it, you know, and so, so it's, it's great to have that, to have them really exposed to everything that the area offers.
Well, in this instance, stepping out of my comfort zone literally gave me a new perspective. Today is a perfect example of how much we all stand to gain by getting outside. So before I leave, I'm gonna meet back up with some of these folks and learn more on not just how to enjoy the outdoors, but give back as well. It's easy to take something as simple as shade for granted, until it's gone, that is. You may have never heard of the woolly adelgid, but it's a little bug that's creating a big problem, threatening to destroy the shelter these woods provide to species of all kinds. All right, Mr. Hemlock, I'm gonna need you to bend over. My lovely assistant and I came out and marked all these trees, we flagged them, so that all the hemlocks would get treated and not other trees that don't need to be treated. Where does the hemlock grow? So its natural range is, is pretty much the Appalachian Mountains. It's a cove type tree, which it likes, it likes shaded forests. It likes to be close to water. You won't really find this tree on the top of a ridge. Why, why, uh, why is it so important that we're out here doing this? It's important mainly because it is a keystone species. Other species depend on its existence. I wouldn't be shocked at all if we find salamanders creeping around down here and, and other wildlife that love this shady, cool, moist environment. Yeah, that's perfect. Is that enough? Mm -hmm, that's okay. perfect. And you, and you see the, this, I mean, you can kind of feel there's some, this there's is some the root? fibrous roots yeah, in there. That's yeah. what we're targeting. So what is this process called again? I'm this is the systemic uh, introduction of uh, an insecticide, the amidacloprid. And we'll pour, the, the, the roots are gonna take this and... Yep, it's shoot. a soil drench method. We're, we're basically just pouring the chemical on the soil and the roots are gonna translocate uh, our chemical to the, the foliage where the insects are, are on the tree. Okay, what in addition to this, what else are you guys doing to, to treat the hemlock? We've instigated a stream side buffer and areas close to the stream, we're not wanting to use this method. We're using a stem injection. So we're actually physically drilling into the tree to get to the tissues where water and nutrients move and we're injecting that chemical into that layer of tissue that moves it in. Okay. So we're, we're mitigating any runoff okay. into our creek or our, our river um, by not using a soil drench and by using these stem injections. Okay. So now that you're finished, we kind of kick that stuff back okay. on. It doesn't have to be super neat, but um, one thing I haven't mentioned is this chemical um, degrades pretty quickly in sunlight. And so um, just to cover it back up to, to protect it from sunlight, we, had, we do have some filtered sun coming in and uh, evaporation or if anybody's in here walking around, they don't, they don't get it on them, so. Perfect. If you don't mind pulling that, just rip that flagging off and we'll take yeah. that one with us. Seeing folks come together to save something that's so easily overlooked really brought out the tree hugger in me. But I must admit, all that volunteering has really got me hungry as well. When you're stepping out of your comfort zone, nothing quite hits the spot like the comfort of good old country cooking. And after today, I feel I've earned at least a few of the specials here on the menu at Cumberland Mountain General Store. So let's go in and see what's cooking. People talk about the good old days being gone, but at the Cumberland Mountain General Store, that's just a bunch of baloney. Typically we make them so that they're about a half an inch thick. That's a normal cut for us. What's a thick one? Let's do thick a... Thick one, go over to your left, about there. Woo! Now our baloney's, instead of just cooking them on the grill or in a skillet like most of the time you do, we cook ours in a deep fat fryer. Why deep fry? It, it crisps up on the outside. When we, when we get done with it, we take it out, we put it on the flat top grill, we put a special sauce that we make up onto it, and then we kind of caramelize that to give it a little bit more flavor. We get a lot of people that come in that like it, 
on a burnt side. Okay. So a lot of times when, when, we, when we put the basket on top of it the way it is now, it'll actually swell up like a basketball right. and get all airy on the inside. Then we'll break that open, we'll throw them back in, then we'll crisp up the insides also. So we'll take those, we'll dump them out onto here, take our sauce. So is this one of the secrets here? This is our special sauce. This is what makes it taste really good. All right, I'm gonna pull my normal one off. Wow. Set that on here. Oh. Take those and dump them into the, into the tray. All, they all go? They all go in there. All right. Now what we always do is we always try to take the, the nicer one or the bigger one and actually put it on the bun. It was a tradition back in the 50s in the old diners like this is every single meal always ended up getting an onion ring. It was just like a garnishment. How has that tradition gotten lost? That yes. is, I mean... All of these things have gotten lost. America, let's pick this back up. I love onion rings. Put it back up here and you yell, order up. Come and get it. No, order yeah. up. Order up. Yeah. Or if you want to go ahead and just take them out and service them. I'll serve them. There let's you go. Because I, I, I gotta, I'm going to maybe help these people eat this. Uh, so good. Oh, that's so good. You would have to stack like five or six pieces of regular bologna to make this. Oh man, it's so good. All right, Haley, here we are behind the counter and uh, we're about to make a banana split, right? Yes. Which is one of my favorites. And my favorite to make. Okay, well then that's, right. we're a perfect pair for this. Uh, okay. Where do we start? So then you're just gonna cut the ends off of each one and then slice it in half. Then we do the ice cream. It's vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. So you do the pineapple on the vanilla, and then you're gonna do the strawberry and the chocolate. Then just three cherries on each whipped cream. I see now why this is world renowned. Yeah. It's I think huge. it's gonna take half of the world to eat all of this. <laughs> Tell me again. A little bit about the history of this place. Well, the, the general store itself was, was built in 1923, um, and it was actually across the street, and sometime in the late 70s, early 80s, it was going to be bulldozed and burnt to make way for a Dollar General store. Okay. So a local family decided that they were going to pick it up, have it brought over here and have it moved and set in place. They bought it as a storage building. They started selling a few antiques. People started coming in, and they just, just kind of grew from there. I mean, just walking through is really a step back in time. When you come into the store, you're stepping into a, 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 an authentic 1920s general store, the way they are always done. We still have the, the old potbelly stove inside for heating. Uh, we still have the original shelves, the original countertops. We try to keep that same era going throughout and everything that we sell. Right. Um, most of it is, is, is antiques, it's collectibles, a lot of it's reproduction. We find the simplest things, um, old-fashioned candy that we have available that you just don't find anyplace else, old-fashioned fudge that we make here. Just all the little things that's just kind of a step back in time for a lot of people. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of the general stores left in the state of Tennessee have gone the route of being more of a commercialized mom and pop. And we've tried to keep it more old style and keeping it the way that it was. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. Well, thank you for we, coming. We got some work yeah, to do here. We do. Are you ready? I am. Let's... All right, let's go. <laughs> Looking for some good old country cooking to refuel my weary bones, and after all that, I must say, I feel right as rain. Which is a good thing, because tomorrow we head into the Catoosa Wildlife Management Area to learn more about all the efforts that go into safeguarding this beautiful land for future generations. Now, all I know is I get to drive a tractor, but from the sound of it, I'm afraid they might be putting me to work. Let's go see. As far back as some of the first Native American tribes, the rolling hills and deep gorges of the Cumberland Plateau have been used as fertile hunting grounds. But as often is the case, the future of this beautiful land was compromised by over-eager industry practices. However, in the 1940s, concerned citizens rallied to restore the land to its former glory, and the good folks at the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency stepped in to help. Guys, I'll be honest, I don't know a whole lot about forestry, but just kind of looking out at this, it, it looks a lot like 
devastation to me mm -hmm. in a way. I mean, tell me what exactly we're looking at. Well, you're looking at a regeneration cut, a clear cut that was done this summer. Okay. And there's been no time for this stand to come back yet. And you can see they've left some, some den trees for different kinds of birds and other animals to use. This travel lane that comes into the, uh, into the cut has been padded with a lot of the extra debris that's left over. Mm -hmm. It's not used uh, or taken to the mill. So it's exactly the opposite then of devastation that we're looking at here. I would say so. Yes. Why are we here seeing this right now? Why have you come in and done this? Right. I mean, the, the big and all-encompassing answer is it's all for the wildlife. You know, that's our job here on the area is, you know, promote the wildlife resource. So all of our forest management is geared toward that. And basically what we've done is we've reset the time scale for the forest. We're gonna have a young forest come back. It'll go through different stages and different wildlife species will use those stages. Right. You can look out across there and imagine this could have been done by a tornado. Right, It's natural. a natural, it's a occurrence. natural occurrence. Nature resets the, the table. We're resetting the table. All right, guys, so we're at our second stop here. What exactly are we looking at? Well, this is, a, this is a cut that was done last summer, so you can see the difference between okay. the one we just visited and this one. So this is a year, a year old. old cut. Okay. Um, behind you is a 26-year-old clear cut. If you look out through here, obviously you see how green it is, Absolutely. number one, mm -hmm. compared to where we were. Part of that green is, is grasses and forbs that's going to serve as a huge food source for deer and turkey and other wildlife. The other part of the green is that it, regeneration of oak trees. Over, over there in the 26-year-old stand, you know, that's become, that's a young forest. Um, in just 26 years, we went from this to a young forest. I love that um, humanizing of, of the forest and, and that... Right. Really, it's just like an individual, a human being. As we get older, Unfortunately, we become less productive. Right. The forest is the same way. As the forest gets older, it's less productive. It produces less acorns for deer. It produces less food. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we're just resetting the clock and going from, you know, a year old to 26 years old. And in that time, we're increasing the productivity of that piece of land. So when you boil it down, I mean, that is the main reason for the clear cut. True. Okay. That is it. After this, we're heading to one of the food plots that, that you guys do here on, on Katusha. And you're going to get to get on a track. I am, which I'm super excited yeah. about, actually, if, you, if, if they actually will. They're, we're going to let so. you, yeah. Okay. All right. That's an awful decision, <laughs> but I'm really glad you're doing it. <laughs> now, th I mean, that's a direct food source. So is that where most of the, the wildlife here are getting their food? No, actually, it's not. That, what we're doing with the food plots, we're serving up the dinner table. We're putting the wildlife and people together. The true wildlife management occurs in, in these clear cut situations because we can't plan enough food plots to provide the food source that we have right here. And mother nature's really doing that, this for us versus planning something for the wildlife. Today we're going to show you how to operate this tractor and fix this food plot here. So what, when you say fix a food plot, what does that mean? Exactly? Gonna, what are we going to be doing? We're going to sow it down in wheat okay. in, in a, probably about a week. Okay. Now that's for who exactly? That is for the deer and the turkeys. So all the work you're doing here, the wildlife management area, like what, what would be the goal of the wildlife management area? Without wildlife management areas, there's a lot of places that a lot of people wouldn't have a place to hunt. Right. Uh, it's getting where there's a lot of people won't let you hunt on their farm, so you need a wildlife management area to, for people to hunt on. All right, so uh, we're gonna fire this bad boy up? We're gonna up. fire this tractor up. All right, you're let's... Gonna, you're gonna be the operator. Uh, there are a lot of levers and arms and buttons here, so I'm already above my pay grade here, so. Well, first thing you do is tilt your wheel down to where you're comfortable with it. Okay. All right. How's that? Okay. Uh, clutch. Okay. Left brake, right brake, throttle, hand throttle. Okay. We ready to fire this thing up then? Whenever everybody else is ready, we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> It's 
been a full couple of days here on the Cumberland Plateau, but I feel like I've barely scratched the surface. And now that I've overcome my fear of heights, I've traveled just down the road to Zipstream Fall Creek Falls to take things to a whole new level. Here we are, Zipstream. I've been looking forward to this all week. I'm super, super excited. You're gonna have a great time. What's in store? Okay, so what we have is an aerial adventure park, which is different than like a traditional canopy tour where you get all the gear, you zip, you land on a platform, someone moves you over to another platform, you do that. What we have is an aerial adventure park. So we have 70 different obstacles or elements. Of those, nine are zip lines. That means 61 are other things that you get to negotiate and climb and traverse across. All right, I thought I was going to be zip lining, so this you is good. Will this zip is line, exciting. All right. It's but there's so much more. There's okay. so much more. Yeah. What we have is a range of courses, so ranging from easy to extremely challenging. Okay. Extremely challenging is just that. There are a few obstacles up there that even our builders sweat when they're going through. But then we have an easy course. Um, one example, we had a woman come and spend her 82nd birthday with us. We say that people should play within their limits, and she definitely made a good choice in terms of playing within her limits. Okay. But she got through our second moderate course, which is absolutely excellent. And it is a physical challenge, but it's a doable physical challenge. Um, you mentioned the builders earlier. And Our you... builders are amazing. Tell me about the course. Well, going along with the whole philosophy of the Adventure Guild, they want to do everything clean and keep the forest safe for future generations. And so when you go out there and you see our course, um, take a look and notice how the platforms are built. Nothing is drilled directly into trees in a way that's going to be unsafe for the trees. Okay. Um, protecting the health of the forest is really key in building these courses because, you know, when all this goes away, the forest will still be here and we want to make sure it's healthy. Right on. Well, I'm ready to get up and, yeah? and experience this. Should we so get you geared up? I, I'm ready. I'm ready. This is your SSB. This is what allows us to do a self-guided course. Notice how only one side opens at a time, right? Once you're locked into the system, it's virtually impossible to get out of it. Mm. This thing is super cool. The only thing I've ever done is like um, Chuck E. Cheese-ish type stuff, so this is fun. I'm this excited. is legit, man. Come on over here. Let the games begin. Let the games begin. You're you anything. Ready. Don't prepare yourself. You're ready. No hands. No hands. No hands. With my first climb under my belt, I've now traded a rock face for treetops and my shaky legs for a smile. I've always made a point of keeping my feet firmly planted on the ground, but sometimes the view just isn't as good. I am not okay with my fears overcoming me, but more than that, 
I'm not okay missing out on the experiences those fears keep me from or losing out on the achievements I would otherwise accomplish. I'll be honest, I couldn't have climbed that wall without Matt on the other end of my rope. It's in the moments that we're most afraid, the times when your legs are giving out and you just want to let go, that we feel most alone. But as I've learned these last few days, when we come together to navigate the challenges life has carved into our path, we stand to gain the most progress. Life will inevitably be full of struggle, but it's only together that we can pull ourselves to the top. <laughs>